Would you live in a luxury high-rise building that had experienced settlement and tilt far in excess of what was predicted by the original design calculations? Before you answer that, consider that the building has tilted as much as 30 inches at the top floor and the pile supported foundation slab has settled as much as 18 inches since the completion of building construction in 2009. Also consider that the building settlement and tilt is ongoing even though there's been recent repairs to try and arrest such developments. And the original predicted total settlement was only four to six inches over the entire lifetime of the building. I don't know how you answered that question, but what if I told you that this building had 419 residential units with most of them currently owned and occupied? Of course, I'm talking about the now infamous Millennium Tower in San Francisco. To give you an idea of the type of high-end units in this building, check out the current listings for about 15 of the units. The Millennium Tower is a 58-story, 645-foot tall building, which includes the antenna mast, so the building itself is over 600 feet tall. It was constructed between the years of 2005 and 2009. It's the tallest residential building in the city of San Francisco, and it's located at 301 Mission Street and is the fourth tallest building in that city. As I mentioned, the building has a total of 419 residential units, and the units that are for sale right now range in price from around $600,000 for around 600 square feet and around $14 million for a 5,000 square foot penthouse unit. The building structure is made of reinforced concrete. The building's original construction cost was $350 million and was developed by Mission Street Development. The building's foundation consists of a 10 foot thick concrete slab that's supported by a total of 945 14 inch square concrete piles driven to a depth of approximately 80 feet below the ground surface. These piles bear in a layer of sand that lies approximately 150 feet above the bedrock contact elevation. Although there are many other buildings in San Francisco that have piles that were not driven all the way to bedrock, I understand that there have been some engineers that have criticized the design of the Millennium Tower foundations given the residential nature of the building, the high cost of the development, and the size of the building as as well as the fact that it was constructed of reinforced concrete in a high seismic area. And of course the building is much heavier than what you would expect from a steel frame building. Apparently during the original design phase there was talk of extending the piling all the way to bedrock, so a depth of approximately 235 feet below the surface. However, at the time it's reported that it would have cost an additional five million dollars to extend the piling to bedrock. So the design engineer and the developer elected to go with the much shallower driven pile foundation to, as I said, a depth of around 80 feet. I'm sure that the design engineer and the developer would love to go back in time and spend that extra $5 million given that everything has happened in the last several years. My name is Casey Jones. I'm a geotechnical engineer and the technical director of foundation testing and consulting. I have over 36 years experience as a design engineer and a testing engineer, primarily for deep foundations, driven pile and drilled shafts. The story of the Millennium Tower fascinates me for several reasons, and I'll get into the details throughout this video. There are several questions to that come to my mind, though. Why did the original design and construction of the foundation proceed with relatively shallow driven pile well above the bedrock contact, especially for such a big, heavy building? Another question I have is to what extent did the designer anticipate the effects of construction phase dewatering, not only for Millennium Tower, but for future construction nearby that was most certainly likely to occur and how such dewatering would likely impact the estimated settlement that was likely to occur during the lifetime of the structure. And along those lines, why was there such a relatively low computed value for total settlement? Again, that four to six inch range. Considering that there was over 150 feet of relatively soft compressible marine clays below the bottom tip elevation of the piling. Another question I have is whether the recently implemented $100 million partial fix is going to be effective long-term in arresting the settlement and tilting of this building. And speaking of the repair, the design engineer originally recommended a total of 52 perimeter piling be installed to underpin the foundation for this building. And because of complications during construction, which I'll get into, they uh, experienced some additional settlement beyond what was expected. And it was rather alarming. And so they reconfigured their remediation plan as it was, and uh, ended up installing only 18 perimeter piling. Another question is how well is this building going to perform in a large earthquake, say a magnitude 8.0 earthquake? So another question I asked myself is whether I would personally be willing to spend a million dollars on average to own one of these units in this building. 
or a variation of this is would I be willing to live in this building if someone gave me a unit for free? Should people consider the original foundation design to be a failure? I'll explore the issues associated with each of these questions in more detail. It's worth noting that although there's a wealth of publicly available information about this building project, I'm not privy to all the detailed design information and calculation methods that were used for this project. Instead, I want to present this narrative in terms of objective facts that have been made available in the public sphere and relate these facts to my observations about typical design and construction methodologies for pile-supported foundations. I also want to provide a perspective from each of the stakeholders that include the developer, the engineers associated with the original design, as well as the design of the repair, the owners of the units, and the residents of the units in this building, as well as the city of San Francisco. As a general rule, if you're a geotechnical engineer and a foundation designer in particular, you don't want your projects to be in the news because that usually means there's some sort of problem. The extent of the foundation issues and associated building settlement and tilt at the Millennium Tower became public news around 2016, and that's when the lawsuits really started to fly. Reportedly, owners of these units started to see their resale values plummet, and many engineers stated their concerns about how such problems could have occurred and posed questions about the overall safety of the building, not just from static loading conditions, but in particular question how the building would likely perform during a large earthquake, which may very well occur during the life of this building. What was particularly upsetting to many of the owners of the units in this Millennium Tower is the fact that the magnitude of the settlement and the amount of building tilt was not really divulged until 2016. In fact, such movements have been observed not only during construction, but after completion of construction in 2009. So the lack of transparency relative to what was going on with the building must have generated a lot of distrust among the parties involved. So before I can dive into the questions that I posed earlier, we need to drill down on some of the more technical aspects of this building's foundation. There was a multi-author report published earlier this year by ASCE that I'll reference here that gave an overview of the subsurface conditions at the Millennium Tower and the magnitude and locations of the building movements. Note that this study was paid for by the developer of the Millennium Tower project. What I noticed about this paper is that they did not really present any clear indication about what the likely implications were for the original foundation design relative to building settlement and tilt. That perhaps is not surprising. While I can appreciate the sensitivity of the situation and the climate of multiple multi-million dollar lawsuits, I was hoping for a more detailed assessment relative to any potential issues with either conceptual or computational issues that may have been involved with the original building foundation design from a case history perspective. I mean, this is ironic because the paper is subtitled as a case study. In my opinion, inclusion of such information would have helped put into context the potential risk that could be associated with other high-rise buildings in San Francisco or even in other parts of the world that have similar foundation types with similar subsurface soil and rock conditions. However, I don't know whether the developer who paid for the study would have appreciated an in-depth assessment of whether the original geotechnical designer who was also retained by the developer would have appreciated such an examination. From the figures included in this paper, we see a profile of subsurface conditions, the type of foundations, and the proximity of adjacent buildings that were constructed after the completion of the Millennium Tower in 2009. So looking at this figure, you have the Millennium Tower, MT, the Millennium Tower Podium, MP, Salesforce Transit Center, STC, which is a beautiful building, by the way, Salesforce Tower, SFT, Salesforce Plaza, SFP, and the Salesforce East Tower, SFE. Again, on these figures, you can see a representation of the relatively shallow piling supporting this heavily reinforced concrete foundation slab for the Millennium Tower. As the authors of this paper mentioned, they looked at a stress distribution below the pile group using the equivalent RAF method. For this method, the loads are distributed at an angle of two vertical to one horizontal below the bottom level of the pile. This increased stress is distributed through the foundation soils lying below the pile tip. Also looking at the paper, it indicates that the old bay clay, or more colloquially known as the bay mud in the layers between the bottom of the piling and the bedrock, has an overconsolidation ratio ranging between as little as just over one to two. So what it means is that these soils are lightly overconsolidated and it wouldn't take much more of an increase in effective stress to cause considerable amount of settlement. You'll also notice that the thickness of these compressible marine clays varies across the building site. 
This introduces the potential for differential settlement. We know that there was construction phase dewatering performed both at the Millennium Tower and adjacent building sites. Much of this dewatering resulted in approximately 30 feet of drawdown, which would result in an increase in effective stress of nearly 2 KSF. The increase in effective stress on the Old Bay Clay from the combined effects of the building loads and the dewatering operations was apparently enough to initiate several components of ground settlement, mostly from the marine soil deposits, as a result of elastic compression to primary and secondary consolidation of these deposits. In retrospect, some engineers say that it was obvious that the Millennium Tower should have been founded on piling driven all the way to bedrock at depths of approximately 230 feet. The actual situation, I think, may be more nuanced and complex than this assertion would suggest. Since the ASCE report attributed a lot of the settlement of the Millennium Tower Foundation to the dewatering operations both on-site and off-site, I would really like to know whether the original foundation designers considered whether such a potential could occur and whether they had advised the developer of the associated risks of on-site and off-site dewatering. In other words, there appears to be no consensus among engineers who have examined this project as to whether the original foundation designers made a mistake in supporting the foundation using relatively shallow piles. This is due to the complexity about what was known about subsurface conditions and possible future developments prior to the start of construction of Millennium Tower in 2005. My personal view is that I would have been concerned about the potential for excess building settlements of such a foundation based on my own experience with drilling, sampling, and testing the Old Bay Clay deposit during a project that I was involved in near the Presidio in San Francisco back in the 1980s. The Old Bay Clay impressed me as a rather poorly consolidated and weak material. As I mentioned earlier, there were multiple lawsuits that were initiated in 2016 once the magnitude of building settlement and tilting was made aware. The main lawsuits were recently settled, which has led to implementation of an underpinning program. Originally, the plan was to install a total of 52 piles of bedrock at the perimeter of the building, and these piles would be connected to the existing foundation map. However, these piles involved installation of an oversized casing, and as a result of this work, the rate of building settlement was observed to have increased. The repair work was suspended and reconfigured to using only 18 perimeter piling on the north and west sides of the building. This partial repair work relative to the original plan was completed in the summer of 2023. The designer of this repair plan was the firm Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager, and their engineer who headed up their efforts was Ron Hamburger, who is also a senior principal with the firm. Basically, their plan for the repair was to underpin the north and west sides of the building that had experienced the most settlement, and then let the other portions of the building continue to settle and level out the amount of differential settlement and tilting. Since completion of this partial repair, there's been some decrease in the overall amount of tilt of the building, but not as much as been hoped for. At least, maybe it's too soon to say. Note that there's an extensive monitoring program that has been required for the project, so time will tell whether or not there'll be ongoing problems with foundation settlement and building tilt. Finally, let's look at the potential earthquake hazard to this building. As most people already know, San Francisco experienced a devastating magnitude 7.9 earthquake in 1906 that killed approximately 3,000 people and resulted in the destruction of many of the buildings in the city. More recently, a magnitude 6.9 earthquake occurred in the Bay Area in 1989 and killed 63 people. The United States Geological Survey, USGS, has estimated that the probability of a magnitude 7.5 earthquake or greater is 20% within the next 30 years. It has been estimated that such an earthquake would result in nearly 8,000 fatalities and approximately $100 billion in property damage. Now, the questions that some engineers have raised about the performance of the Millennium Tower Foundation during significant earthquake loading involve three main areas. The first is the potential for liquefaction of the upper sand layers, the effects that earthquake loads would have on the foundation and building, given the magnitude of settlement and tilt, and what the effects would be of the heterogeneous nature of the building foundation that consists of both shallow and deep elements. Ron Hamburger has stated that he thinks the building is even safer relative to seismic risks, given that this partial repair has been completed. Others, however, remain skeptical. One aspect that I would be concerned with is the issue of strain incompatibility in the subsurface given the use of both shallow and deep foundation elements. Back in the 1980s, I worked on a project that was determining retrofit requirements for an auxiliary dam foundation at the Folsom Dam Project. One of the foundation improvement measures was to create soil cement columns to form cells that would theoretically contain any zones of liquefied granular soils and prevent lateral spreading. The project team brought in Dr. Ralph Peck to act as an independent consultant. We attended a meeting with him near his home in New Mexico, where he stated that his biggest concern about such an approach was the issue of strain incompatibility between the liquefied soils and the soil cement columns. 
In general, heterogeneous foundation types for a given structure are best avoided in my experience. Let's circle back to the remaining questions that I posed at the beginning of this video. After considering the information about the history of this building and its settlement and tilting, would you be willing to live in the Millennium Tower? If so, do you think it's worth the average $1 million per unit cost? Even though this building is considered to be safe for occupancy by the engineers involved as well as the city of San Francisco, would you be worried that additional settlement or tilt would greatly depress the market value of those units? You know, it's likely that this building will function safely for many years to come, yet there remains many uncertainties. I wonder if any of the engineers currently involved with this project are living in Millennium Tower or would be willing to live in Millennium Tower. Back during the Soviet era, the engineers who designed bridges in the Soviet Union were expected to stand underneath the bridge deck that had been loaded with several trucks at the conclusion of construction before the bridge was open to traffic. That's what you call putting your money where your mouth is. I'd also be curious how much decrease in market value there could be for such units in Millennium Tower, given the increased reporting about social issues that are occurring in the city of San Francisco. And let's not forget the broader risk context. The large magnitude earthquake event is likely to strike San Francisco within the service life of Millennium Tower. There are likely to be far more risks associated with just living in such a city, whether or not someone's actually living in Millennium Tower. If you like this content, please hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons and leave a comment. Thanks for watching, everyone.